And welcome to week three. Uh, I'm Zach Roof from securingthestack.com, still continuing on in our uh, Linux architecture discussion. Uh, super stoked because, yeah, now we're starting to get into the process uh, management and uh, how the, the CPU kind of delegates tasks uh, and, and kind of the, the interactions with the kernel as well. So now uh, it's continuing to... Uh, so we'll, it was fun before, but uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we're still, uh, it's still evolving. So let's go for it. Okay. So, in a single core machine, are all processes running at the same time? So, this is just kind of a question for you just to think about. Uh, so, you see all these programs running. So, are you know all those processes running, you know, parallel, right, um, on a single core machine? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, essentially, okay, so multiple processes can access the CPU in a given time span but only one process may actually use the CPU at a given moment, right? So single core, of course. So, but that kind of begs the question, how does this process management occur? Okay, so process management example. So process A will utilize the CPU for a predetermined amount of time. Okay, that's called the time slice. And a, a you know, yeah, we'll, we'll go into the time slice right here. So a time slice is enough time for a significant calculation. Okay, and it's usually a few milliseconds and a single time slice is usually enough for a process to finish its current tasks that it needs. And then, okay, and also one other little thing is the kernel controls the amount of time that's allocated or basically the, the dur how long the time slice is is, is kind of kernel controlled. And once the time is up, process A is paused. And then process B starts, you know, etc. But here's the cool thing, okay? So what, what occurs in the time between A and B? We're kind of starting to get a little bit more in depth here. Okay, it's called the context switch. It's what it's called between uh, uh, A and B, uh, process A and B uh, kind of uh, switching off. Okay, yeah, then the switching of one process to another. It's controlled by the kernel. And here we can start kind of getting a little bit more in depth. So a process's right time slice just finished. Okay, let's just assume that that just occurred. Okay, so what's going on behind the scenes? So the CPU stops the current process and switches the CPU from user mode to kernel mode. Okay, so as we've seen, ring three to ring zero. The kernel records the current state of the CPU in memory. And why? Okay, so this is utilized for when the process is resumed. So the kernel performs any tasks that came up during the previous time slice. So that'll be collecting input output, etc. So I mean, that's another thing, right? So it's like when you're when these things are occurring and you type something on your keyboard, right? That's essentially, you know, I mean, the, the kernel, once that process is finished, is really going to be going in and, and pulling in that information from, you know, the, the, the relevant buffer, etc. So anyways, let's go into to number four. So once completed, okay, um, the kernel has finished its kind of housekeeping tasks, so to speak. Okay, the kernel's process scheduler looks at the list of processes, uh, processes uh, that needs to run and picks a process to run based on an algorithm. And just as a little kind of background, or we're not going to really go into it, but this you can kind of think of this, or actually the, the current kernel's process scheduler is called the completely fair scheduler, and it runs on an algorithm called the red red back tree algorithm. So, okay, so we go ahead where the, the, the process scheduler picks a process to run. Okay, the kernel prepares the CPU and memory for this process and starts the time slice duration, right? And the kernel switches the CPU into user mode. So ring zero to ring three. And execution of the next process begins. So multi-core considerations. These are, you know, when you have multi-core and this whole kind of uh, delegation process is occurring, it's a little bit more complicated, right? And that's just because the kernel doesn't need to give away control of the CPU in order to allow a process to run. Why? Okay, and that's just because the process can run on a different CPU. However, this typically doesn't occur because it can diminish system performance. But it's just a little side note. So RAM management, another huge thing that the kernel does. 
So the kernel keeps track of all RAM, okay, just in general, and how it's shared between processes. Okay, the kernel splits RAM into many subdivisions, okay, pages, and maintains state information about these subdivisions at all times. Now, remember, I was kind of talking about this thing earlier about the page table, okay, and and how that is you know, uh, uh, an idea why we only utilize those rings 0 and 3 in more common, you know, uh, operating system architectures. Well, now we're starting to get into what is held in that page table, okay, and that is pages, okay. So each process gets its own portion of RAM. Okay, and the kernel makes sure that each process doesn't utilize the memory of, a, of other processes, right? Or processes, sorry. Um, and that's, and, you know, the private memory that is, okay? Um, we'll see that there are certain ways that uh, user processes can actually share kind of a common uh, memory area. But for our purposes right now, um, the kernel is just making sure that each process doesn't utilize the other private um memory of other processes okay so and that's just sandboxing as we've already spoken about so when does this ram management occur okay so this is just a question for you to kind of sit and think about okay so when does the kernel take control right yeah so during the context switch right so that's when the ram management occurs and the kernel upholds some of the following conditions. Okay, so the kernel must have its own private area in memory that the user processes cannot directly access. Okay, so what's this area called? And we've we've already kind of spoken about it a little bit. And that was actually the kernel space. That was the answer there. Okay, and each user process another kernel condition uh, or another kernel thing uh, or, or kind of a, a kernel condition that it must uphold is that each user process needs its own section of memory which cannot access the private memory of other user processes. Okay. And what's this general idea called? We just spoke about it pretty, pretty recently. That's sandboxing. Okay. So let's look at a couple more conditions that the kernel upholds. If requested, user processes can share memory with each other in a common area. Shared memory doesn't come from a user process. That memory is always private. Shared memory comes from the user or from the system's free memory pool. And some memory in the user uh, in the user process can be flagged as read only. And there's actually a bit in the page table that houses the the user uh, there, there's the pages are stored in uh, a data structure called the page uh, the page table right and they're called page table entries specifically and each page table entry actually has multiple bits that are associated with it and we're going to be looking at that but one of them that can be uh, kind of a bit um, that can be associated with it is like a read-only flag. Um, so that's kind of how you can start essentially, um, you know, starting to make more uh, some of the memory here a little bit more granular on their permission, permissions. And the system can use more memory. Now, this is where it starts to get really fascinating. The system can use more memory than is physically present. Uh, by using disk space. So this is another thing that the, the kernel uh, helps deal with. Now, how does this work? This is very fascinating. This And this has, a, has huge implications um, for our... Um, for our kind of for our memory uh, management and and for ex in particular in for, for, for sandboxing. So let's let's check this out. Okay, so why memory management? Okay, so there's just in general, why do we need to manage memory before we, we get into the exact specifics? Let's just look at it from kind of a 10,000 feet foot view. Okay, security implications, right? Like we need to manage memory and the kernel needs to because what's if, you know, 
Joe Schmo's application could just go in and and just you know read from disk you know with without even with even without asking correct permissions or or not read from disk or, or read from other processes in RAM right um, so that would kind of be um, security implications you know for for RAM or memory management. And here's where it gets really confusing because confusion of a shared address space, right? So think about it. I mean, every memory location, you know, there is a physical spot for a bit uh, in RAM. So, and that needs to be addressed, right, properly. And, you know, where does it get stored? Where does your information get stored? So think about it. it without, without memory management, right, a developer would need to check if a certain memory address is being used before using it. But what's if all these other different processes are trying to just randomly access the same memory location, okay? That is can be very obviously confusing and a huge headache for developers and just users because things will be crashing nonstop. So, and it also, as we were kind of speaking about, okay, it, it allows us um, to not, memory management allows us to not be inhibited by the physical memory allotment. And we're essentially going to be looking that at that at, in uh, virtual memory and that's the memory management scheme that kind of allows these things to occur um, and so I think this is a natural place to stop uh, for this week because yeah this gets uh, pretty in depth but anyhow um, it's it's very useful especially in into sandboxing and, and etc so thank you so much for uh, tuning in and really looking forward to uh, kind of seeing you guys or uh, hopefully hearing from you too or, or <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not seeing you guys obviously this is a computer but uh, hopefully you know hearing from you uh, you know kind of in the comments section as these lectures are kind of coming out. That would really mean a lot to me. So anyhow, uh, hope to hear from you soon. Okay, bye-bye.